thank you so much for inviting me to be here. For sure. How's life? I know that things are starting to open up a little bit. Are you having any fun at all? Oh, this morning has been chaos. Chris didn't go to work because he's having vision problems again. So sorry, I didn't join earlier. But oh, other than that, things are pretty good. <laughs> How about you? I'm happy to be. I went to like a wine tasting at my girlfriend's house last night. Ooh, fun. I haven't done, I haven't done anything social like that in a long time. I think. <laughs> For my birthday, we had like a game night a couple weekends ago. So it was fun to see all my, you know, local friends in person. It'd been, you know, over two and a half years since we had a game night. So it's nice. Yeah. It feels, yeah. So yeah, we need a fat brunch. We need to get together with all the fatties. I miss my fat in-person fat community. We have a great community here. We're so, we're so lucky. We have I know. Great, I'm so jealous of your community. <laughs> we have a lot of people. It's really pretty amazing. So it's a lot of fat. There's a lot of fatties in the Bay Area. Well, there's only like 9 million people here in the Bay Area. So they're bound to meet some fat people here. <laughs> Meanwhile, in all of New Mexico, we only have 2 million people, like the whole state. <laughs> So it's like to have my home state, Nevada, is the same way. Three million, right? two, two and a half million are in Vegas. <laughs> right? Yeah, crazy. <laughs> I, I wore purple for you today, but I think it might be Thank too you. dark to see. <laughs> it, looks, yeah, it looks dark. I can't tell. Um, let's just wait two more minutes and then we'll we'll get started. How's your podcast going? Good. Really huh? good. I need to have you on. Yeah, I know. We need to do that, huh? <laughs> Oh, you can info interview me as a podcaster. <laughs> yeah, how's your show going? Really good. We have our third episode to, um, put out there today. And, Congratulations. Uh, yeah. I don't know. How do you measure if, it, if a podcast is doing well? I have no idea. Um, join the, po the group She Podcasts. It's an excellent um, Facebook group. I'll send you an invite. Okay. Um, but they're really supportive. Like when you get your first 100 downloads or 100,000 downloads, everyone cheers. I really, it's a very oh. supportive environment but they they answer a lot of like the basic stuff oh, cool. um i mean it i think they say like the average podcast gets like 27 downloads so anything beyond that which i'm sure you're beyond that is successful and stuff so yeah it helps, it helps to have talk about sex toys it makes people want right. to especially if it's in the title <laughs> yeah we're, we're i guess I, i'm using buzzsprout and like their next um big hi Hi, Carol. Their next big um, milestone is 750 downloads, and we're really close to that. So Yay! I'm sure, I'm sure we'll get there today. Yeah, totally. Then, like, then what's next? Do we get? Do we try to get the reviews? Is that the important thing? Or downloads? Yeah, Trailers? Apple. Get, get people to review it on Apple because that helps to get more visibility on it. Very cool. Yeah. Awesome. All right, let's see. I'm gonna, yeah, I saw you sent me your questions. Thank you for that. Sorry to hear about Chris. That's a bummer. I know. All right, it's one o'clock. So let's go ahead and get started. Welcome to Jen McClellan. Also like Pia and I, we met at the Body Love Conference what was that six years ago, seven years ago now? Yeah, it was 2014. Oh, wow. It was like April time frame, wasn't it? Yeah. yeah it was so such it's a almost great like time. our anniversary. <laughs> I know, I know. I met so many amazing people there. Oh, and um, gosh, Jess and just so many of my Facebook friends are people I met at the Body Love Conference. I wish there could be another one, but yeah. Anyway, so Jen, tell us a little bit about you. Tell us about how you got started in this fat community world. Tell us sure. a little bit about what you're, what you're up to. Well, first off, Crystal, thank you so much for having me. I adore you. I think of you often, like when I'm alone at night, occasionally with something <laughs> that buzzes, like you <laughs> came to mind because I think I have mine because of yours. So anyways, I think of you often and I adore you and I love everything that you do for this community where our voices aren't often heard and we don't get to talk about how awesome sex and pregnancy and parenting can be in a larger body. So right. I really appreciate you having me. My name is Jen McCullen. I'm the founder of Plus Size Birth, which focuses in on plus size pregnancy and the host of the Plus Mommy podcast, where the tagline is from bumps to bellies, we talk about it all. So going beyond pregnancy into motherhood and just lifestyle and all the things. 
So um, my journey started back in 2010 when I got pregnant with my son as someone who exists in a larger body going online and not seeing any positive information on what it is like, let alone finding images of people my size pregnant. Like, what is my belly going to look like as it grows? Uh, so after I had my son and I, I connected with size friendly care providers, I gave birth on my knees in a hospital. Like it was so amazing and was completely supported by a team that encouraged me. And it was actually my midwife that was like, climb up on the bed on your knees. And I'm like, which is so empowering to know how strong and capable my body is and to have that supported care system to be like, of course, your body is capable of anything and you are healthy. It was really life changing. So then I started blogging and writing and I ended up becoming certified as a childbirth educator because I'm like, we need to create change, especially in pregnancy. There is so much harm being done to people of size. Um, and so we've been doing that for a decade now, and it's been this incredible journey. And I feel like we're finally at this like turning point where there's acknowledgement of our experiences of plus size as plus size people. Like they organizations now care about our experiences, which it's like should not have been happening from the start. Um, and I collaborated with the, actually the National Institutes of Health. I was able to go to on campus and present and it was an amazing experience because they wanted to hear from the consumer's perspective of the harm that's being done and how can we create change together. So <laughs> that's that's my journey to what I do today. And I'm really honored to be here to answer questions that people might have or even dispel some myths to talk about evidence in a new way. and. Yeah, I'm just really thankful to be part of this amazing community here. It's so amazing to me now, because when you look at how many images there are and how many people are talking about this now, it almost seems like it was never ever, and it, not, not out there, because it seems so normal now. Right. When I um, started, Instagram wasn't around. And now to date, there are over 80,000 images of plus size bodies connected to plus size pregnancy hashtag. And on TikTok now, it's in the millions of impressions. And I'm so, so glad that we have such a celebration of diverse bodies. And Amazing. I'm rolling out later this month, um, the first ever plus size pregnancy week by week guide. Like what are some things that might be different? How can you advocate? What is the evidence of certain recommendations that are made because of your size? But not only that, I wanted to collect images of plus size people pregnant, and I've collected over 800. So oh. people will be able to go and be like, oh, what would my body look like at like 25 weeks? Oh, here are all these bodies. Um, and I'm really, really excited about that. So that'll That's be coming amazing. out soon. That's so fantastic. It must be so scary nowadays because I know a lot of people when they get pregnant now, they get told so much stuff. Oh my gosh, you should never... You shouldn't be pregnant. You shouldn't get pregnant. You should lose weight before you get pregnant. Oh my God, your pregnancy is going to be horrible. And most of it's not even true. Yeah. I want to, I want to share something that I think like might be a little polarizing and some things that I might say might be, um, I'm comfortable and if there's any need to pause or shift in the conversation. But one thing that people are told is that their vagina is too fat to birth their baby. And anecdotally, I'm like, what the beep? <laughs> like, like, are you like enraged, right? Because it doesn't just impact how people feel about their ability to birth their body. It impacts intimacy with partners. It, it impacts their body image. It impacts their self-esteem and their self-worth. So I actually hired a researcher because I'm like, yeah, I can look at the evidence, but I want to hire a researcher to dig into multiple studies to see where this came from and is this even evidence-based. And the researcher was like, I'm so excited because this seems like a bunch of BS. And we did. Like, she dug into it and it is BS. Like, your vagina can't be too fat to birth a baby. And so I have an article that shows all the evidence because sadly, some people need evidence um, to dispel this stuff. So ridiculous. But um, that's a lot of what I'm really passionate about doing is dispelling these myths and these these things that we're, we're told will happen to us or the way we needed to be treated. And then it's very frustrating because there's a lot of privilege wrapped up in the ability to change care providers, which is not something 
everyone can do. So how do we help to empower people that don't have the privilege or the ability or the means or the medical insurance to just go wherever they want um, and also providing them with resources and tools to advocate for themselves. And I wish this wasn't such a battle. Yeah, it sucks. I mean, the, the point that I guess I hear a lot about is that um, the medical community is going to convince you that you're definitely going to have gestational diabetes if you're fat and pregnant. Yeah, that's let's let's look at the evidence behind that because I think that's really fascinating. Um, when we hear that, we hear like, oh, it's like a, a guarantee or something like given. that, which is it's ridiculous. Yeah. And I think for you know <laughs> those of us that exist in larger bodies, every time we go to the doctor and something comes up and they're like, well, the evidence is you're five times more likely to X, Y, Z. Well, what does that even mean? Because that's about the rate four to five times more likely to incur gestational diabetes if you have a BMI. And yes, we can do a whole sidebar on that BMI is BS, but this is what the medical system and insurance uses. So we're, we're playing in their sandbox. So if, if we have to use BMI as a, a benchmark, right? So if you have a BMI over 40, your risk is four to five times more likely to incur gestational diabetes. What does that mean? What is 40%, 50%? It's, it's very confusing. So all that means five times more likely, <clears throat> whenever you hear that in any context, whatever it is, that is called relative risk. So that is comparing the rate of someone who exists in a smaller body and their risk factors to you who exist in a larger body. It's just looking at the difference. Mm -hmm. That tells us something but that doesn't tell me about my actual risk factors. Right. And so if you were to ask your care provider, okay, but what is my actual risk? Odds are they're not gonna have an answer offhand. Right. Uh, they're gonna know the relative risk, but not actual risk numbers. And when we look at the actual risk for gestational diabetes, as an example, it's about 17%. So I teach people, and when I talk to care providers, I'm like, let's flip the script. You got about an 83% chance of not incurring gestational diabetes, and none of that is fixed because we know that with nutrition and intuitive eating and working with, you know, a health at every size nutritionist and finding joy in movement, all of those things can reduce our risk even further. So there's no fixed number. So yeah, it's, it's a way of reframing things and talking about it and looking at like, the odds of having a healthy outcome for a pregnant person and their baby are actually in their favor uh, if you go into pregnancy healthy and we know that people can be healthy at every size. So a lot of that, what I do is dispelling the myths and then working within a system that isn't uh, as easy to be like, okay, well, I'm not going to be weighed today or as easy there, there's, it's different in the maternity system often where you're getting pushed and pulled in different ways because you, you're pregnant too, and it can be a very power dynamic situation. So how do you advocate for yourself? But I hope talking about the research and being like, okay, well, what is my actual risk can be empowering for people, not in maternity care only, but in any care um, right. to really break it down more. Yeah, you're right. We still have to deal with, always going to have to deal with the BMI, at least for now, right? But what your doctor should be doing is looking at you. The BMI is just like, overarching, not specific to each person. Yeah, they should be they should providing be your, individualized your health care. So for anyone who needs to have well women visits, a pap smear every couple years, um, you might want to look into the midwifery model of care because midwives provide individualized care and they tend to be more size inclusive. Not always. We still have right. to do that research, but overall midwives do 10 and they work with people, you know, from uh, preconception to menopause. So it can be um, a different inviting, a different environment that might be more welcoming and accommodating to people in larger bodies. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, so you used a midwife and but you had your you had Braden at the hospital. I did. Yeah, you can work with midwives. Um, hospital based midwives mm -hmm. are certified nurse midwives. And then there are midwives that work outside of the hospital, certified professional midwives um, okay. and certified professional midwives can do pap smears, too. So um, yep. not just during pregnancy, but yeah, um, mm -hmm. 
you can work in the birth centers, but unfortunately birth centers often have BMI cutoffs. There's some new research showing that that also shouldn't be happening. Like there's a lot of new research coming down that's very, very exciting. There's a lot of energy from younger midwives and OBs that are tired of not only the fat phobia, but the systematic racism, especially yes. in maternity care and the heart-wrenching numbers of maternal mortality for Black women and babies. So it's really, really important that these conversations are happening and that these younger care providers want to see change happening. You know, things are really fucked up when Venus Williams almost dies from having a baby. Yeah. And not not being listened to and not being heard, not being seen yeah. because she's a black woman in the maternity ward. It's heart wrenching. And she has every resource known to man. Yeah. And she still got treated like shits. Yeah. Yeah. Every- yeah. I'm so thankful that she put her story out there and yeah. put out her you know, to put herself out there in that way and to share all of that in that beautiful documentary too that she did. Like, yeah, it's 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 heart wrenching. Um and it's Maybe. beyond time that we <laughs> see change happening. Uh, way, and yeah. 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 Is there anything that people of size should know before they decide to become a mom before they get pregnant? Yeah, I had someone ask me like, oh, um, it's always, you know, society says lose weight, lose weight. I'm like, health, like, look at your health, because we want to be in optimal health for pregnancy. And I know health is something that we need to dive into more and talk about more. Absolutely. But with pregnancy and increased risk, we really want to look at overall wellness. So looking, and I always point people to just treating your body as if it's already pregnant. So you're finding movement that brings joy, not dieting, not focus on weight loss, like that is dangerous during pregnancy. And for so many people, they're in that weight loss mentality. So if they can spend time breaking free of that, then they will be far healthier overall. So yes, I always encourage people to connect with a size-friendly care provider as early as possible. If you go to the doctor and they're like, well, you need to lose X amount of pounds before even getting pregnant, then you, you don't want to work with them during pregnancy no. for sure. Um, but focusing on things that bring you joy, uh, sleeping, um, getting enough rest, like looking out for your mental health, all these things that we know promote overall wellness are going to be ideal for pregnancy as well. And any yeah. stage in our life, right? But especially for pregnancy, because it does take a huge toll on our bodies. But we know that people of all sizes can and do have healthy outcomes. And no one should be told that they cannot become a parent because of their size. That is absolutely wrong. And the things that people are told during pregnancy are horrific. And we have studies to show that if you just bring a support person with you, the way you are talked to by your doctor as a person (laughs) of size for anything, not just maternity care, um, you tend to receive more compassion. And I just, I'm so frustrated with that, but it's true. Mm -hmm. So if you can bring a support person um, and if they can't, you know, come with you in person, like being like, uh, you know, hey, I'm, I have a friend on FaceTime, or I'm going to record, right. I'd like yeah. to record our conversation because my partner wants to be aware of everything, like finding some ways to bring someone else in. Um, I wish it wasn't like this. Um, but more and more, I am hearing from people that are connecting with size friendly care providers. You know, it, it's a money thing too, right? Like this is, healthcare is a business yep. and the more care providers mistreat people of size and turn people away, they're starting to see the impact on their dollar line, bottom line. They're starting to see the impact on the reviews online and yep. on Facebook and all of that. So it's like, oh wait, oh, I guess I should treat people of all size with compassion. And you're like, <laughs> Yes, because Uh we see better health to health outcomes when we (laughs) treat people of all sizes and meet them where they're at. So I love the idea of bringing somebody or your phone or recording it when they're when they know somebody else could possibly witness the way they behave. Yeah, it's a lot nicer. And And by the way, fat women have been having babies for a millennium. Oh, uh, yeah, (laughs) yes, 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 yeah, and I I think knowing that we are have agency over our bodies knowing that for those of us that are mentally competent adults there is nothing that we have to do and i think for so long we've been led to believe that you know doctor knows best and we have to do what they recommend but you don't and in fact 
Care providers should be asking your consent before everything, before touching your body, before doing anything. They should be asking permission. And this isn't happening and it needs to be happening. So even, um, you know, it, it's hard to advocate for yourself in those situations. But for me, as someone that does this advocacy work, I try to model that behavior. When I go into a room and there's only a small chair with arms, I ask for another chair to be brought in. Whether or not I'm going to sit in it or not, I ask to make sure the correct blood pressure cuff is being used, um, making sure that there is a gown, if I need one, that covers my body. Um, I've even heard some great things from thin allies that are saying things like, okay, I need you to lift up your shirt. And I'm saying, um, you know, would you like me to lift up my shirt instead of I need you to, or you need to do this, like helping to reframe the language. So Good. people are in control because there's, when we have someone who's barely covered with a sheet or something that doesn't cover their body, there's that being stripped of dignity, that power dynamic, you do not have to let a medical assistant come in. I've been dealing with skin cancer, which never thought I you know, recently had some um, taken out and they're like, okay, well, we'd like to bring in, the, you know, the assistant. And I said, no, thank you. And I, I knew that I could say that, but so many people don't even know because they were going to do a full head to toe, very vulnerable where they lift up your breasts and they do all this thing. And like, I was, I have anxiety and I was so nervous. And I just said, no. And I was so thankful I'm with a doctor that was just like, no problem whatsoever. Okay, you need to go. <laughs> but that doesn't always happen. Right, yeah, but even you. in teaching facilities, you can say no. You mm. have agency and autonomy over your body. Um, and yes, there are, I mean, there's some emergent situations where we don't have that. Sure, but, sure. you know, there's so much coming out that's happening in healthcare. Like people who are having operations having pelvic exams for teaching hospitals without consent and we're talking about these things now and we're saying enough is enough this cannot continue um and that is so important that we're just even aware and we can use our voices and say no and say you need to be asking permission before you do certain things or i have the right to say no awesome yeah i mean i didn't even know that so that's great information thank you <laughs> so the other day I was at the um, Target and I saw this lady that I've known for a long time. She had a couple of kids with her and um, I don't, didn't recognize them. They must have been like their kids, friends or whatever. But the one little guy was like, you have a really fat belly. Is there a baby in there? No, there's no baby in there. But isn't that cool how bodies are so different and how some bodies are small and some bodies are big and... It, I recovered from it just fine, but you know, how do we deal with that, Jen? How do you deal with that yeah. with your friends and stuff? Well, and I like how you said I recovered from that just fine because no matter where we are, our journey to body love or acceptance, sometimes like that still sucks, right? Yeah, You're yeah, just like, yeah. I'm just trying to go to Target, you know, like <laughs> I don't need to have my body pointed out. Um, you know, my son, uh, we were driving one day and I, I was glad we were driving because my face wasn't pointed toward him. He's like, you know, mommy, how'd you get so fat? And you're just like, well, I knew this was going to come up sooner or later. And that's, <laughs> you know, that's where I've been modeling the conversations that I've had with him his whole life of all bodies are good bodies, right? Bodies mm -hmm. come in all different sizes, shapes, colors, abilities, and how boring would life be if we all look the same and making an effort to show different bodies. And, you know, when my son was little and wanted a baby doll, I encouraged him to get a baby doll. Like, you know, all the these messages that we're told by society of what is appropriate wasn't like, no, no more. And I'm so glad the younger generations are coming up and saying like, no, like all bodies yeah. should be represented and celebrated. Um, and especially bodies of color too. Like this is so incredibly important. So um, with Brayden, we just had a conversation normalizing the bodies are all different. And I really try not to talk about my body, my body size. I don't, I try not to talk about his body because when we focus on it, then it, we just try to focus on, hey, your body, when instead of being like the size of your body, like look at your body, you just swam back and forth. Like how amazing is that? The strength of your arms, your muscles. Right. Um, and I found that when my son was in competitive sports, it was actually really hard for his mental health because, you know, some kids are just have are better at soccer than others, right? Sure, and then yeah. 
when you have a kid that is suffering or struggling with self-esteem or body image and you put them in group sports, it can actually be harder on them. But if you give them a sport like swimming or um, let's say like martial arts, where it's them and they see their own growth and their own progress and their own strength, it can really help to boost their self-esteem. Um, and so talking about those things with them, all bodies are good bodies. How do we like to move our bodies with joy? Um, never, never dieting in front of my son or doing that. Um, being really mindful of even some disordered eating patterns that I have, knowing that that you, you think kids don't see it all, they do. They hear it they all. They absolutely do. They so I like to remind it. people and babies, like, all bodies are good bodies. And I've been in that situation at a park where a kid was like, mommy, she's so fat. And I was like, yeah, I've got rolls and your mommy does it. But how neat that we both have different bodies. Like, just normalizing that all bodies reminding that all bodies are good bodies and kids get it like they get it so much better than adults and modeling that is really really important so important and Braden's dealt with bullying and stuff too and we just reiterate to him that you know those kids they're having a really hard time and I, I it's really sad that they're going through that and they're taking it out on you but you show up in the world with kindness to others and being inclusive of everyone and that's how we walk through the world knowing that you know we want to meet people where they're at and feel sorry for those that choose to shame us in the process i used to struggle with some relatives of mine and um their household was like you know um nothing feels as nothing tastes as good as being thin on the refrigerator you know and so when i would spend time with those kids I would re just remind them, you know, like, don't you just love that your all of our bodies can hug other bodies? And don't you just love how your your body can take you from one place to another? And I would just try to just like drop little, yeah. you know, without being too, I mean, I know that their, that their family, their parents would not love the things I was saying and doing. So I was trying to be real strategic about it because I didn't want to say too much, but just trying to give them a little bit of like, oh, I do love hugging Crystal. I love putting my head on her tummy or whatever, you know, and I just uh, I'm like, please let me help. I'm just doing a little bit of help to help them be to be less of an asshole when they grow up. <laughs> and I'm sure you did make that impact. And like how sad that that family didn't realize that that message with you and I'm sure many people of all sizes in their lives was so, you know, demeaning. It, it's it's not okay, but diet culture is so pervasive to people of all sizes, right? It's so ingrained and it's caused so much harm. And I never want to put that on my child. And I want yeah. him to love all kinds of food and all kinds of movement and feel great in his body. And yes, there have been times, especially as being a person that was bullied a lot as an adolescent when I gained a lot of weight because mom took me to Weight Watchers with her. It, you know, I have my son now who's going through adolescence and his body is changing. And so it's been helpful for me to know the data that kids' bodies should gain weight at this point, right? They should be changing in different ways because they're going to get taller or bigger or fatter or smaller. And none of that matters. But sometimes as a parent, it just helps to know because often we do care about health, but that this is healthy and that this is normal. And I want my son to feel good in his body and never hear his parent be like, oh, well, you know, we're worried about this or you need to that or, but you know, like, no, you're like, your body is amazing just the way it is today. And I also <laughs> model, model that in the pediatrician's office. I had, when you do the um, annual visit, you fill out this big form, right? And I write on it please do not talk about BMI. Happy to talk about um, movement and nutrition because we can still have the same conversation that they need to have for their checklist without right. talking about, I say, don't talk about weight or BMI um, yeah. because they have a kid's BMI chart. It's, yeah. Um, and so we're able to talk about like, well, Brandon, how do you like to move your body? Like we're able to have those same conversations or like, you know, what do you enjoy eating um, in a way that isn't going to make him feel badly about his body? Because I know, especially in adolescence, it's such a vulnerable time and those Very messages so. are so hard. I, I was going to say, I know that Ashley and Selena in this group, I know that they both have kids. I'm not sure about the other people that are on the call, but Ashley and Selena, I would be curious to know if this comes up and, and from everybody, if you, any of you have kids or nieces and nephews, has this come up 
from you or your kids before? Have they ever called you fat? Have they ever called out your fatness or anything else? Selena, do you have anything to share about that? Have you, and how do you model it with your kids? By the way, Jen, Selena is a um, COVID survivor and she was, yeah, she has a new book out and she was very sick for very like 300 and 19 days. So yeah. Wow. But she so has sorry. just has a new book that she just published as well. I'm excited to learn about your book too. Um, just to parrot what you said, Jen. Uh, yeah, my kids, they follow a BMI chart at the pediatricians and I've not proactively, but during a visit said like, you know, we don't talk about weight. We don't do diets. You know, it's not about that. And no kid should be on a diet. I mean, my mom put me on Weight Watchers when I was 12. I want to say. And, and she was constantly on the diabetic diet, this diet, that diet, whatever, for her whole life. She probably still is. Right. But, you know, I just, I've talked to my kids because I know the kids are cruel for mm. a number of reasons. <laughs> was one, you know, and then. Just also because I want them to know that I'm not ashamed of my body, yeah. but you know, they're boys, so it's different for them same. than it is for me. But at the same time, you know, I, my biggest fear is always that they'll be embarrassed to be in public with me. And I, they've never given me that kind of indication, but it's because I think I'm not ashamed of my size yeah. and you know I very well could be that person in the grocery store that when somebody says are you fat be like really mm -hmm. what did you say, did you say <laughs> I'm hard of hearing you know <laughs> it, it, it's just um it's just not something we focus on and and also because kids have so much these days why do they focus on and then why should they hate their bodies Right. Don't change how we're presenting. You know, and it's easy to go, oh, I hate my hips. Blah, blah, blah. You know, but if I don't comment on my body and that I don't like parts of it, then they're not going to do that either. Yeah. Yes. Like what you said, like not talking about bodies, it can be helpful to just be like, talk about what bodies can do as opposed to what they look like. Yeah. So what important. they can do. I, I did comment in the comment section, the chat here that. I really wish you'd been around when I was pregnant because I I had no joy in pregnancy whatsoever because not only do you not have any clothes that fit properly, I had no maternity clothes options. I just had to wear bigger sizes in shirts and stuff. People at work didn't even, like after I'd gone on maternity leave, some people still didn't know I had been pregnant. I don't know how that happened. Yeah. But but, you know, and I had one of the obstetricians in the rotation for my children, like, was completely fat phobic, and I refused to see them except Good. For one time. Good. You're required to see everybody. Right. So they're on call when you go into labor. I told my husband at the time, listen, if that person is on call when I go into labor, I'm putting a plug in. I'm not going. <laughs> like, I'm, just, I'm just not. Because I knew from their body language and the way that they treated me when I was at the appointment or whatever, I'm like, that's the thing that's most appalling to me is how the medical community yeah. relies on BMI and all these archaic notions in order to label you somehow as being not healthy. Yeah. And I know Crystal has said this at times, you know, they're always like, amazed that my blood pressure is okay or that I don't have diabetes although COVID gave me that but yeah. I have something else to deal with and people won't be surprised that I have diabetes because I'm fat or whatever but you know that was something I didn't have oh, you know and I got I have neuropathy in my feet now mm. so sorry me to get around oh, you know and at 47 I never thought I'd be this useless as far as being able to do things you know my my two boys they're 13 and 16 and they are my saving grace honestly Good. they do so much 
I mean, I have one under the sink right now. <laughs> under the kitchen. So I just, you know, but we, we face so many obstacles, especially medically. We do. And now there's ingrained in them and from medical school on. Yeah. That, that is bad. You know. Yeah. But now the good news is that there's studies to show that when people of size feel shamed by their care providers, they're less likely to receive routine health care and more likely to gain weight. And so we have a lot of evidence to prove even the medical bias within health care. And then just recently in 2020, a study finally came out about weight bias in maternity care. It's the first to come out in maternity care. And it showed that two thirds of people during pregnancy experienced weight bias. And this was people of all sizes. And mm -hmm. unfortunately, I think that that's what it'll take is for everyone to feel shame for them start to bring more awareness. But we have so much to indicate the harm that's being done that is counterintuitive to what we all want, right? Like I, when I speak to, uh, to care providers at conferences, I'm like, we all want healthy pregnancies and healthy babies. Like, how do we get there together? Because shaming people in the process does not get us there, making people feel badly or being even afraid to go to, into labor because of who might be on call. Yeah. Horrific. And I'm so sorry you went through that. And that's completely unacceptable. And, and a lot of people don't know, like if you, cause you're with your o, OB, if you have an OB giving birth, they're there at the very end. You maybe see them pop in a couple of times, but you're with your nurse for hours and hours and hours until shift changes. And so many people don't know if you have a nurse that is treating you or you're feeling uncomfortable, you can ask to get a different nurse. Like you have the ability to say like, no, I'm not going to be treated this way. I'd like to speak to the charge nurse and get someone else. Now, sometimes they don't have a lot of nurses available, but at least you know that you have the right to say, this is not, this is not working and I want someone different. Um, but yeah, it's so unfortunate that it has to be such a battle and that we have to bringing in a team and so with a team for anyone who might be coming pregnant like if you can hire a doula um to help and support you they can be really great advocates they're all also really great gatekeepers of their communities so they know like who the fat phobic care providers are what hospitals have really high cesarean births there's mm -hmm. uh, an incredible doctor that's doing a lot of work around cesarean birth and helping to reduce the risk. And a lot of that is put on people of size. Oh, our rate is so high because of plus size people. And I've always publicly stated that the bias against people of size plays into the astronomical right. rate of cesarean birth. Right. Um, but he looked into the fact that your highest risk for having a cesarean birth isn't your size at all. It's what hospital door you walk through. Ooh. because uh, some hospitals compared to others have different safeguards and procedures and policies that lead to higher cesarean birth rates. And I had him on my podcast and it was, I loved how he talked about how he's trying to create change and how he wants to be size inclusive because there's so much <laughs> harm happening that's oh, yeah. only leading to outcomes that create you know, poor health outcomes for people of all sizes, but especially for people of size when we know increased risk for cesarean birth and healing and all of that too. So, um, and cesarean birth saves lives and it's wonderful. And like, I'm not saying anything negative about it. I'm just saying it's, it's often used as a, well, we don't think you can sustain labor. So you need to have a cesarean birth when that's not even evidence-based. Um, so it's really frustrating and just letting people know that they have options and rights, but often when you're pregnant, you, you feel stripped of that. Often any doctor's appointments, you feel stripped of that too. Yes, totally. Hey, Ashley, I saw you say something in the chat, but I couldn't read it. Um, do you mind taking your mute off and letting us know what you just said? Uh, I don't mind. And I was going to chime in earlier about the kiddo stuff, but oh, please. Yeah, I would love to hear. It was so interesting listening to what Selena had to say also, but um, I was just talking about the doctor thing. My doctor is amazing. And he actually because a lot of what you were saying there, Jen, just, you know, <laughs> medical professionals. My doctor was so mad when a specialist came at me about my weight, when that is not at all what I was there for. He, I called, like, my doctor, his name is Ben, and the specialist, his name was Ben. So I had good Ben and douchebag Ben. <laughs> and I went to my Ben and was like, douchebag Ben said this <laughs> with my husband in the room, who is a fit person. 
Wow. And my doctor was like, uh, no, this is what I want you to say. If you go into any, any care provider, be it your OB, be it for your heart, be it for whatever it might be. And they even mention your weight. I want you to say to them these words and I want to practice it with you. <laughs> Science and studies have proven that doctors aren't successful or effective in helping people lose weight or manage weight. That's not why I'm here. I'm here for you to look at my vagina. Are you able to focus on the reason I'm here without focusing on my weight? If not, I have the right to leave and file to have this fee for this appointment refunded. Like, Are you yeah. able to focus on my vagina? <laughs> yeah, I, I, have, I was just like, I'll just throw a random thing in there. So like, go to the vagina doctor. Look at my vagina. Don't That's a great it. pick, but I love that language. Yeah, and can it's you so share true. that with us, actually? Yeah. Let's make a meme out of that or something. I don't know. I want to write a blog about that. That's amazing. Yeah, yeah I really can. Mm -hmm. I was, I was like, I found my doctor for life. I love you. Oh yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, and what, it's so amazing to get almost the bare minimum, right? Like I had my labs run and my doctor was like, you're healthier than me. And I, I was know. like, like, just to hear that was amazing. He's not like the best doctor ever, but it made me feel like he was. Because right. he gave me the bare minimum, like when I compare your labs to mine, you're health, you're healthy, you are healthy, is what he said to me. And it was so amazing to hear that and to know that there was a care provider who said those words. And it just needs to happen more often. But it it's also sad that we take the bare minimum and think that it's incredible Bread when crumbs. we should have been getting that from the start. Settling for breadcrumbs, we have to do it all the time. Jen, um, when I had my hysterectomy, they made me do an echocardiogram. I thought I was going for EKG, but I was going for ECG. EKGs are those things on you that you're in and out. This is like an hour and a half appointment. Long story short, my uh, oncology gynecologist said, your heart is perfect. Well, but I ate a um, apple fritter yesterday for dinner. <laughs> I'm like, could you see it floating around? And she's like, no, your heart's perfect. I'm like, I'm going to get that put on a fucking t-shirt, a hat, a medallion. And every time I go to Kaiser, I'm going to be like, my heart is perfect. Because of course they all assume that it's not. They assume that I have heart disease or di diabetes or whatever, you know? I'm like, no, yeah. my heart is perfect. And I can't, are you sure? That was perfect. Awesome. Yeah, but even if we had all those things, we should still be treated okay, with compassion. Dig it. And we all know that, right? Yes. But it seems like, um, you know, that, that frustration of, well, if you're a good fat person that, and I'm like, no, no, it doesn't matter. You should always be treated. With we don't owe anybody dig. good health. We really yes. don't. Yes. Just, no. Yeah. Carol, did you, I saw a little hand raised there. Yeah. I was just going to say, I, um, I always remind people that the heart is a muscle and a muscle gets stronger the more you work it. Right. And so you shouldn't necessarily be shocked. I mean, you know, there can be all the other things, the smoking and the, you know, cholesterol and all these other things that can affect it, but it can also be perfectly healthy. And, um, you know, you can no more tell that a person walking down the street that's fat has a an eating disorder or heart disease or diabetes or blah, blah, then you can, a thin person doesn't have any of those things, right? you know, because there's nothing that we as fat people have that is only a fat person disease. Not, yes. even, one, not so, even one thing, not even one disease, nope, only not one thing. zero. <laughs> Man, we're just not special enough. No. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but I reiterate yeah. that in pregnancy too, right? There is not only one thing that plus size people incur, even though we're made to feel that way. Yep. So it's so, so important. Um, and I wish, yeah, I wish it wasn't such a fight. Um, but we know the difference that connecting with a size friendly care provider can make throughout the trajectory of our healthcare, regardless of what type of healthcare we're receiving, is just so hard to connect with someone mm -hmm. who is size inclusive. Um, and I know that more lists are being made and directories of size inclusive providers. And that's really, really exciting. Um, I get really frustrated when people say, oh, my, my care provider is really nice, but they don't have a blood pressure cuff that fits. Like, no, I, you know, that they're not providing you the baseline of healthcare that you deserve regardless of how nice they are. So it's got to be multi-level, just not that they treated me nice or they didn't mention my weight, but that they have the tools and resources to provide you with the health care that you deserve. Yep, totally. So nuts. I can't believe what it's still, even just the other day, I have like 
I really don't want my blood pressure taken unless you have the better cuff for me. Well, your arms aren't that fat though. I don't really carry my fat in my arms. I go, I still know that I'm going to get a better reading with a cuff that's for a person my size. So she's like, oh, I have to go to another room. I'm like, I don't care. I'm not going to have my blood pressure taken with that little fuck. It's just, it's so little. It's such a small thing. And, and then the fact it? that you had, yeah. And the fact that you had to fight that raises your blood pressure. Uh, right. You, had to, you know, even. <laughs> Yeah. And adv and speaking oh, of blood man. pressure, you know, advocating usually it's like, okay, you they actually you step on the scale and then they're gonna take your blood pressure. Like right, <laughs> it yeah. makes no Perfect sense. Timing. It seems like yeah. But um <laughs> that you are supposed to actually be seated for at least five minutes with yeah. your feet firmly planted on the floor, even right. talking can change your blood pressure. So I'm mm -hmm. you know, talking to people more and more about advocating for getting their blood pressure taken at the end of the appointment yes. and the beginning, especially, I mean, for all healthcare, but especially during pregnancy, because when you are labeled as having high blood pressure, that's going to change the trajectory of the care that you receive, extra yes. appointments, which can incur extra costs, having to see specialists, like this is something to really advocate for in general, but especially during pregnancy. Um, but but you're just advocating for the base level of how people have been trained to read blood pressure. Like you're not asking for anything above and beyond. You're asking that you receive an accurate reading. And a forearm is not going to give you an accurate reading. An automated blood pressure cuff is not going to give you as accurate as a reading as, you know, using the correct size cuff. And yeah, it's really... it costs like twenty dollars for this cuff. Like, I know. It's so <laughs> like it's not <clears throat> ask at all, and it should be standard in every single um, office. And 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 those things like you know the chairs without arms. That's another thing that every time I go to the pediatrician, I still make a note in their comment box of like there needs to be time. space for parents of all sizes to sit comfortably. Like. Anytime I have restaurants now, I've been like, nope, I need you to bring me another chair. Like I've been in Crystal, you helped me to model that when we went on a date to the Cheesecake Factory a, a oh, lifetime yeah. ago, you know, it's yeah. like, it's taken me learning from you and others to be, you know, an advocate to teach others to advocate for themselves. And it's so effing exhausting, but I have to believe that we are creating change for our children, for our friends' children, for their children. And at some point in time, conversations like these won't need to happen and what a beautiful day that will be yeah hey Ashley, do your kids mm -hmm. um do they ever mention that you have a i don't know fat tummy or whatever or do they how do they know that that's not okay uh well so my kids are are really far apart in age so i feel like i've experienced this at two different like time periods not just in my life but like in the world like there was different levels of acceptance back when Dakota, who's my oldest, they, uh, they're going to be 18 in June. So like, it was very different back then. It was only 18 years ago, but that was a long time ago, as far as like movement and acceptance and body goes, yeah. um, versus my youngest who just turned 11, um, with Coda, I would say there was not, not from Coda. Coda never said, mommy, why are you fat? Or, and never made a comment um, because their dad is extremely fat phobic. Um, like that was the reason why our relationship fell apart was because I gained a lot of weight when I was pregnant and that he didn't like it. Um, so he, they grew up hearing these constant voices from him, just like, you know, you don't want to end up like your mother. You don't want to look like that. You don't want to, you know, do those things but because of that you know and it's kind of one of those situations right where people are met with with emotional abuse and they go one of two ways right for coda because they also had me kind of balancing this out they ended up being a super empath very generous very loving very empathetic never talking about body size but they struggled internally with it so while they never said mommy why are you big you know why do you have a big tummy um, they did a lot of like self hate for themselves. So them, so they and I had to work really, really, really hard on their own body acceptance and their own body love. And and I I've, I've done a lot of you know of pushing the the counter narrative of, of and really encouraging them to examine health in a different way. Um, and that's like 
you know, a lot of the stuff that you, you've mentioned, Jen, and, and talking about how every body um, is a good body and how great it is that we can do these things with our bodies. And, you know, Coda and I have done yoga together a bunch and yes. we, we do, we do a lot of things together. So that way they can see that like my body does things, their body does things. And so they've kind of gotten a different journey. Whereas Addie, my youngest, um, she did. So she is very vocal, very outspoken. Um, and, and it wasn't to me, but it was to like, it was kind of in front of me to one of her friends. Um, and it was when she was like four, you know, she was really little and she, her friend was like, your mom's really fat. And she was like, yeah, she is, but she's also really beautiful and really funny. <laughs> like, I was like, ha ha, bitch. <laughs> like, Good on the moment, like, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So I was like, ha. Huh. <laughs> like, but that I mean that's like it kind of shows the compare yeah it was I was definitely in my head like Fuck you you little shit um but like but that's kind of the the difference in how things were with Coda where it had to be this very gentle soft mm-hmm. compassionate nurturing thing and it was never really brought up whereas Addie was like yeah and uh-huh. you know, like, I, <laughs> so she's gotten the bigger brunt end of me being exposed to like Mm. crystal and the fat community and, and being really involved and, and even just having these things available for her to see. So it's a very different world for her. She's coming in and she gets to be the generation of kids. Who's like, I don't fucking care. Like my Mm. body is a good body. I don't care. It's it's just, it's very different. Yeah. I'm I'm excited for these younger generations. It's frustrating. There are studies to show that it takes 20 years from the time something is proven to be evidence-based in healthcare to the time it's implemented. 20 years. I'll be 74. I know. I'm like, I don't have time. Like I've been doing this for a decade now and I'm in my (laughs) forties now. Like things have to improve like way faster. Faster, Um, But we also find that a consumer push can help to change things faster and I think we're seeing that right like how amazing was it to see the don't weigh me cards go viral right oh yeah conversations can help expedite how people are treated but it's going to take that consumer push we saw it happen when kangaroo care putting um babies uh skin to skin was proven to be um effective but then we saw it happen much faster because parents were like yeah this makes sense this releases oxytocin feels good for me it's got to feel good for the baby and so we saw a rapid change in healthcare. and i just think we're all so tired right and this people have been doing this work in the fat activism community for so many decades now that it is enough and now we finally within these past 10 to 15 years have more data and research to show to prove that harm is happening so it's beyond time like we don't have another five or ten years that we need to be sitting through um we need we need to see it happen but it's so exhausting right and i don't want to i don't yeah, want to have to be this way i don't want to yuck your yum since you brought up oxytocin but it, it made me think of two things. First of all, I see Reagan getting invited to all kinds of places to talk about medical fat phobia. And I know she does the Lord's work. I mean, she's out there all the time with her fucking data, with her proof, right? I love it. But I sent her something that I saw on Facebook the other day, a new diet to use your oxytocin. I, I'm like, Reagan, did you see this fuckery? <laughs> like, I can't even, and it was like, they're based a diet on how do you, I was like, help, help us, please, Reagan. Like, this is a, <laughs> I can't even believe it exists. Why? Just, yeah, I've been, I've been a fat actress for 35 plus years. Thank you. So I have seen all of this stuff come and go between all the different surgeries, you know, did you know ileal bypass? That's the one to do now. And then, then the sleeve and the this and that. And every single one of these diets, you know, whether it's the grapefruit or now the oxy uh, uh, cotton oxy. thing, it's like, oh yeah, oxytocin. Um, <laughs> yeah, that's another kind. Um, <laughs> yeah, and, and it's, it's, they're cyclical in nature and it just keeps coming back and coming back. And we, <clears throat> we have to always be on guard um, you know, this whole thing around pregnancy over oh, 30 years ago, 
I had a friend that really, really wanted to be pregnant. I mean, she wanted a baby more than anything. And she finally got pregnant and then miscarried. Mm -hmm. And when she's in the ER, miscarried Jean, this child that she really wanted, she got a weight loss lecture. Yes. Then when she continued to go down this road to try to get pregnant again, you know, she would have doctors look her in the eye and say, you have to lose weight if you don't lose weight. And because she was a fat activist too, she'd look him right back in the eye and said, okay, here's what's going to happen. If I lose the weight, I'm going to be too old to get pregnant by the time I lose enough weight. Or my body's going to be so starved, it's not going to be able to carry a pregnancy. Exactly. So, you know, let's get over this BS. And talk. she ended up having to adopt because, you know, for various reasons that kind of continued to happen to her. But it was just, I mean, she would write about this. I was in a theater group years ago and she would write and perform pieces about this. So I have these, I have her words in my head sure, you know, sure. about it. And, <laughs> um, you know, she, she would just like, okay, doctor, I can predict two outcomes, you know, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> and um, so. I'm, thank yeah. you for sharing that. And yes, the stories I've been told are, are heart-wrenching. It, it's, yeah, heartbreaking. I will say, like, again, with the new studies that are coming out, one just, just, just came out on, um, so people with a BMI, oh, forgive me, um, over 30 get tested for gestational diabetes immediately early on in pregnancy, and that's what they're told. It doesn't even show up until 24 to 28 weeks, but they're told they're actually being tested to see if they're already pre-diabetic or diabetic, mm -hmm. but they're having them do the glucose screen. So a study just came out that showed that doing this based on BMI alone showed no difference in the prenatal care outcome. So they've been making people drink huge amount quantities of sugar, right? The sugar and glucose drink that makes so many people feel sick, putting them through this, and there's been no positive outcome through it. Like most people know if they're diabetic or pre-diabetic, or we're going to see other markers, we're testing urine mm. and blood pressure and so many other things at every prenatal visit, um, that this one test that they've done specifically, the American College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists recommended it um, for people with a BMI over that number, um, that they wasn't, that we're not seeing the benefit of it. So I'm really interested in seeing how this is going to um, trickle down into yeah. the standard of care for plus size pregnancy, because that's one of the few additional tests that are recommended when you exist mm -hmm. in a larger body. So I hired that same researcher to dig into this study because, you know, one study you know, mm -hmm. we got to be careful when we're talking about studies and actually looking into them. Um, and she's like, no, this is a good one, Jen. And so I'm like, ah, so I have that blog post coming out soon too, because I, my goal is to always work to make sure that people aren't classified as high risk based only on their BMI. And I'm really outspoken mm -hmm. about that because of all the financial and emotional and time and so many other ramifications that don't get considered. Like we're talking mm -hmm. hundreds to thousands of dollars more with that label that may not even be medically indicated. It's based only upon weight. So these are, this is the work that I'm doing behind the scenes because it's, it's just causing un, unnecessary stress and interventions for people that are having a low risk pregnancy. So the more the data is coming out, it's getting really, really exciting now. Oh, fun. Oh, I love it. Yes. Yay. Well, thank you for all the work that you do, Jen. I, yeah, I see you, you busting your ass. I know. Well, Thank you for all of the people who have laid the groundwork for me to do this work too. Like I, Carol, I acknowledge you. that Carol and so many people here and so many people in, on all of our communities, like it has taken so much legwork. Um, and yeah, I just all need in plus size pregnancy and it, um, it's been a, a really, I, I, my background is an end of life advocacy work and now I get to do it in birth. And so it's been a really beautiful journey and thank you so much for having me here. And if people want to look at the pregnancy work, it's over on plussizebirth.com and then my podcast is Plus Mommy. Yeah, yeah. Selena. Selena. I, I just had one comment because of what Ashley, <laughs> Ashley. about how places don't have fat butt approved chairs. My friend Tracy Thompson wrote a book, it's fiction, but it's called Fattropolis. And it's like mm -hmm. reverse yeah. where fat people, 
You're, you want to be fat and not skinny? And this fat girl has a boyfriend who's skinny and he can't get fat for the life of him? And it's such a good commentary <laughs> on what things could be like. Yeah. Like. I'll totally order it. Yeah. So, you Can you imagine a world where there's only so, fat out of proof chairs everywhere? It yeah. was so moving for me just because it, it just put my brain in a whole nother category. Yeah. Yeah, I read it. It's Maybe good. this is possible. Oh, did you? Oh, cool. You know, mm -hmm. and I think it's encouragement for everyone who's advocating for themselves in a larger body and that there's so many people out there doing the work that that needs to be done you know and and in my dating books not uh, much help in that situation but um you know just to i've i've felt so blessed by the women that are out there you know like you crystal and you jen and, and the other ladies that were here today you know that we're all in community and that makes a whole difference too because when I felt like you know I'm the only fat person in my friend group and stuff like that I mean it gets very isolating yeah have the internet and platforms for us to to share and be together and Crystal you should do this live event in November okay <laughs> you said it's in San Jose Probably. I don't know. We'll figure something okay. out. But yeah, Selena, I'd love to do that. share the title of your book again, Selena. Yeah. It's called Swipe Left, My Misadventures in Online Dating and Why I Chose Myself Instead. Good job. I love it. I Great love title. it. Hey, um, Jen, do you still have your ebook? I do. I wrote a book on everything you could want to know about being plus sized and pregnant, and I updated it in 2020. So I have that, but I have a free guide on how to connect with a size friendly care provider. It's specifically around maternity care and probably stuff you guys all know, but um, yeah, I just appreciate it. If you know anyone that's getting pregnant, if you want to share plus size birth and um, that week by week plus size pregnancy um, breakdown, um, it's all free. Like that was really important to me. Like, yes, this is what I do for a living, but I want to put out, I try to put out as much free information as I can to help create change. And I'm so like, I'm just so excited to get it out into oh, the world. Um, and so, yeah, doing a lot of that work in the, in the podcast has been a lot of fun to, to interview like OBs and be like, all right, let's have, like, I had a conversation with an OB that felt like people should be labeled as high risk. And by the end of our conversation, she was like, I, I see, I see differently now. And that, oh. like, that is so profound. And then I'm like, we're recording, right? Like making sure <laughs> that we have this. And I just had the researcher on last week that showed that weight stigma is happening in maternity care and how do we take this information and unfortunately you know it got released during the pandemic so we couldn't get a buzz as much of a buzz around it then and now everything that's happening in the world but hopefully we can um call more attention to this data and be like enough now we have it in maternity care to prove weight stigma is happening like enough is enough and I'm, I'm sorry one thing that was really powerful is that it not only found the weight stigma is happening, it found out it had adverse health ramifications, including increased risk of postpartum depression, um, weight retention postpartum, and gestational diabetes, that there was a connection there. Just from how people were felt mistreated by their care providers showed a connection of those health ramifications. So enough is enough, right? We all know this, enough is enough. And now let's hope that the data truly helps to create some change, some needed change. Thank you, Jen. Thanks for everything. And uh, yeah, thank you. thanks to all of you who definitely came way before me. And yes, thank you all. Yes. And thank you, Asher Lee, for always helping out. I appreciate you. And it's great, great being in community with all of you. And anybody else that has any last things, anything? Otherwise, we'll just call it a day. When um, when I was reminded about the, the um, like living in a world where fat was the norm and thin was was not, I wrote a, <clears throat> a theater piece uh, years ago, and it, and one of the things is it was that sort of a world, and so when you flew on an airplane, thin people had to be embarrassed because they had to ask for extra padding to hold <laughs> them into the seat enough. 
<laughs> and seatbelts that would pull tight enough across them. So just to end on that little little vision. That I is a it. great way. And I've become the person that I get on that plane and I'm like, I need my extender, like <laughs> killing it. So in Kurt, and I, I always Instagram stuff too, because I want other people to know that there is no shame in putting your safety first. And that's going to be a beautiful thing of the more we're like, hey, there is nothing wrong with saying I want an extender. Other people are putting their safety first. And that's what matters, mm-hmm. right? That we feel safe, that we receive evidence-based compassionate healthcare, that we can exist in the world without feeling shame. And unfortunately for us, that hasn't been our reality, but I'm hopeful mm-hmm. for the future because I'm seeing it not only from my kid and other kids, but from healthcare providers that are younger and are like, this is some BS. Like, how is this Bullshit. patriarchal <laughs> system that has failed so many people, but especially people who exist in marginalized bodies for so long and the time for change is well beyond. So it's time. Yes. Yes. Thanks, well, thank you all so much. I adore Thanks, you, Crystal. <laughs> I adore you too. Thank you. Miss you. Thank you. <laughs>